Let's give some praise to the Lord. He's worthy and he's, he's holy. And, and that word holy means he's pure. That means he's pure. He's absolutely pure. And this is what we must understand that he's holy and he wants to make us holy. So he specializes in taking impure people and purifying them. We don't come pure. We come needing to be purified. Now, the more purified or holy we become, this is what's going to happen. The more satisfied you're going to be, the more peace you're going to have, the stronger you're going to be, because you're going to become more like his character. Life will pollute us, right? And I'll give you an example. If, you, if someone hurts you and you're angry with them and you're in this room right now and you're so frustrated that you can't even think right now, this is what's happening. Your heart got polluted by them hurting you. And it's polluted by unforgiveness and hurt and anger. And the more you hold on to that, this is the truth, the less happier you're going to be, the less content you're going to be, your life will become a living nightmare. This is what I've learned. When our hearts are polluted, it even pollutes our dreams. You start getting nightmares. It, when, when you allow someone to pollute you, this is what happens. They live with you and forever. I mean, they're in your thoughts. They're in your emotions. But I got good news for you. You can not only be forgiven. It's time to let that stuff go. Let all that. Maybe someone did hurt you and... Maybe you're a little boy, little girl, and they molested you when you were a child. And sin is always after our innocence and our purity. But even then, God can purify you and make you a brand new person today. That's what God does. He's holy. You could become holy like him. Isn't that good news that we could become holy like him? I am so proud of you. every one of you that are here. Uh, we got a full house here, and I'm sure we got some overflow and and I'm sure there's a lot of people online as well that are tuning in. And we are here together to grow, to become more like Jesus Christ. Growth. And today I want to talk to you a little about, more about growth. And this is what we're going to be focusing on today. And this is the title of the sermon. Your next level of growth is up to you. Your next level of growth is up to you. Maybe you've never heard this. I think even in the church, we expect the Holy Spirit to help us grow. This is what the Holy Spirit does. He empowers you to grow. But you still need to take a personal responsibility for your spiritual and personal growth. That's why you're here today. You are here not to attend church. You are here to grow. And this is a great discipline that you showed up to church today or you tuned in. And you're here to grow, to become more like Christ, but you're participating in your own growth. Is there anybody here that wants to go to the next level of growth in their life? Do you really, do you really want to go to the next level of growth in your life? We'll talk about that for a moment. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word today. And, and I'm asking, Lord, to speak, Father, today. Speak through me. Help us to understand what's being said so we could apply it to our lives and see the next level of growth in our families, in our emotions, in our ministries, in our, in our businesses, in our career. You want us to prosper and succeed and grow in every single part of our lives. I thank you, Lord. We receive your word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all sit down and, and I want to start off with a really strong statement. And this is a statement, God commands us to grow. Say it with me, God commands us to grow. You might know the Ten Commandments, but have you ever heard that God commands you to grow? That means if he's commanding you to grow, that means it's your responsibility. Let's look at the scripture in 2 Peter 3.18. It says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The scripture is saying, I want you to grow. I've given you everything you need to grow. I've given you my word. I've given you access to, my, to, to me through prayer. I've, I've, given you, I've given you a church. And this is kind of how it is in the physical realm. I've given you muscle. 
Now, if God gives you muscle, uh, you have to work that muscle for it to grow. And whatever, whatever God has given you, you got to work it so you grow. You can grow in faith. You could grow in love. Don't wait to feel more loving to start act, act, or acting more loving. I can't wait till I feel like being nice. I got to start practicing being nice. You know what that's called? Exercise in love. And as you're exercising, you're activating that spiritual muscle and it will grow. Do you know your faith can grow? Your skill can grow. Your education can grow. Your wisdom can grow. It's our responsibility. The word grow means to increase, to grow up in inward spiritual growth. Just like the Holy Spirit doesn't go work out for me in the gym, the Holy Spirit doesn't work out for you in the spirit either. I wish the Holy Spirit would just go into the gym and I could just stay at home. Because I, this is what I would, I'd have the Holy Spirit do a whole bunch of crunches. So I could come to church with a six pack. Right? But this is how it works. God's giving me muscle, but if my muscle's gonna grow, I'm gonna have to exercise it. And that means that growth is up to me. In any area I wanna grow in, this is what I'm gonna have to do. I'm gonna have to activate or put effort in that area. So, how do we grow? Number one, we grow by growing in knowledge of God and His Word. You're not going to grow in knowledge of God and his word until you're intentional about it. I remember my senior year in high school. I was going to Fontana High School. It's in the IE. And it was 1985. Somebody, who wasn't born in 1985 yet? Praise the Lord, you little children. Right? I was get, getting ready to graduate my senior year. And... I knew within me there was a lot of spiritual weaknesses. I was given in to a lot of temptation, and I knew I needed to grow. Because if I didn't grow, my temptations, my struggles, and life was not going to get easier. I would have to grow and become stronger. Stop praying that the devil goes away and start getting stronger so you can resist the devil in Jesus' name. Your problems won't go, go away. You're going to have to learn how to endure through them and overcome them. That year, I made a decision. Say it with me. I made a decision. That I, and it was a decision I made to grow. And that year, I decided and I committed to reading through the whole Bible that year. It would be the first time in my life that I would read through the whole Bible. I wanted to know God better. And I wanted to grow spiritually, and I made a commitment. Don't expect to grow at a level, an, a high level, when you have low-level commitment. Stop expecting maximum growth when a, with a minimum mentality. Grow. So I wanted to grow, so that year I decided to read the Bible from cover to cover. And I did. And 2 Peter 1-2, it says this. May God give you more and more grace and peace. You're going to want this. It's a reward of growth. More grace and more peace. Say it with me. It's a reward. You want more grace and you want more peace. And I'll explain to you what grace is and what peace is. But it's attached to your growth. God says, I'll give you more peace and I'll give you more grace as you grow in your knowledge of God and Jesus Christ. I want to know Christ or Jesus better. Well, this is what the Bible says about Jesus. Jesus is the Word of God. The better I know the Word of God, the more I know Jesus and the more I love Him. Don't expect to grow in knowledge of God apart from learning intentionally the Word of God. I will not accidentally know the Word of God just like I wouldn't accidentally know geometry. I would have to open the book and I'd have to study it and I'd have to work out those problems until I understood it. Many of us have put more effort in solving a math problem that's solving life's problems. 
that we, we read this scripture with a lackadaisical attitude. If I understand it, I understand it. But you don't go in there, I must understand this. I must understand this principle. I must unlock what the scripture is telling me. Because when I understand the word, I grow in knowledge of God. You guys get this? Can anyone understand the word of God? Any believer can understand the word of God. I'll tell you why. Because believers have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will begin to, if you want to learn, you can learn it. Just like today, you're going to learn. But who's the one's going to learn? The one that makes up his mind to learn. Now, how do we grow? We grow in knowledge of God through hearing and understanding the word. I met someone in the foyer after first service, and they told me, I want to thank you for making the word of God so simple I could understand it. And for the first time in my life, I'm going to church, and I'm learning, and I'm growing. And this is what I told him. This is what I told him. The Bible says you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. This is what the scripture is saying. Truth that you don't understand has no impact on your life. Truth doesn't set you free. It's understanding truth that sets you free. We must get to the point that we're hearing more of the word of God with an attentive mindset. I am not here to spend time in a Sunday service. I am here to attentively listen and hear the word with a mission to understand it and apply it to my life. I am here to grow. Is there anybody here to grow? Look what the scripture says in Proverbs 1.5. It says, the wise hear. The wise hear them or they hear the word. They hear the Proverbs, they hear the principles of God, they hear them, and grow in wisdom. So the wise hear and grow. I would, then I could also say, the unwise hear and they don't grow. This is, this, there's a possibility that you're in this room and it's going in one ear out the other and this is a big waste of time for you. And if someone asks you, what did you get out of that that Sunday morning service, you could actually say nothing. Not because something wasn't taught, not because truth wasn't given, it's that you never listened to grow or listen to understand or listen to obey. Look what the word hear means. So they hear. The word hear, it's a, it's a Hebrew word and it's pronounced shama. I like that word, shama, shama. So they listen to attentively, attentively in order to understand and obey. So they're listening to understand and what? I want to I wanna unlock this. I want to figure it out. Whatever class that you go to, there's a lot of people on YouTube that have been successful in certain areas and they're always selling courses. Maybe they were successful in the stock market. Let me show you how to be a day trader. And they'll sell you a course that might cost you thousands of dollars with, with continual coaching. And you might spend $10,000 on coaching because you want to learn how to be more effective at work in the stock market. And you would listen, not just to listen, you would listen to understand and apply it so it could produce profit. Why would you listen to that kind of teaching to produce profit when the highest level of teaching is being presented to you that could profit your family, profit your marriage, profit your emotions, but we listen with less attentiveness than we would listen to someone that's trying to teach us about money. Let's look at this. The more we grow, this is why it's important for you to grow in understanding of the Word of God, in knowledge of God, the more of God's grace and peace you will experience. Say with me, more grace and more peace as I grow. And you might be saying all the way to the back row saying, what is grace? Well, let's explain it to you. It's a, it's a Greek word and it means, it's charis and this is what it means, joy. Your joy will grow. It, and this is also what it means, delight, pleasure, favor, blessing, 
satisfaction. The more you grow in knowledge of the Lord, the more satisfied you'll be as a person. You are dangerous to yourself when you're living with complete dissatisfaction in you. Could it be the reason you're dissatisfied is because your relationship with God and your knowledge of God and His Word hasn't grown? And if you don't find your satisfaction in your relationship with God, you're going to be searching for satisfaction somewhere else. You're going to be like the Rolling Stones singing, I can't get no satisfaction. Is that your life? Nothing satisfies you. I'm going to give you some truth. Nothing will satisfy you than understanding or developing your relationship with God. There's no alcohol that can satisfy you. There's no drug that can satisfy you. You could visit a thousand porn sites a week and you will not be satisfied. You could go and spend your money on a prostitute and go to a Morongo casino and spend all your money on the slot machine. Nothing's going to satisfy you. You can make all the money you, you want in the world. But until you find this out, that your only satisfaction is going to come in your relationship with God and get it to know God better, you're going to have a testimony. I tried everything and I was still empty. Is that true, church? Also, grace means strength to endure difficulties and trials. As you grow in knowledge of God, trials are going to get easier for you. That means they're not going to overwhelm you anymore. Because you're not the same person you used to be. You used to get a little pressure and buckle under pressure. It'll get you cussing so easy, giving up, blaming, criticizing, walking out, punching people. But something's happened to you. You're in the same trial, but you're not the same person. Last trial overcame you. This trial didn't overcome you, not because the trial was easier, it's that you got stronger. Same trial, different person. I've grown. You used to get me so upset when you were rude to me. Now I just overlook your rudeness and I just realize you're not mature enough. But I'm not going to let your rudeness and your immaturity make me immature. I used to get all mad and, and start cussing you out and, and doing the, you know, hood hood rubberneck but not no more something's happened within me I'm getting to know God stronger and these trials don't intimidate me and I'll tell you why because I know my God is bigger than the sickness I know my God is bigger than the financial crisis I know my God is bigger than my enemies I know my God is bigger than the giants that I'm facing I know who my God is is there anybody here wants to grow in grace It also means when you grow in grace, you grow in the ability of God to do what we can't, you can't do. It also means to grow in grace means to, it's a grace that promotes and empowers progress and prosperity. It also results in a life of gratitude. How do you know you're growing in grace? You're a nicer person. Just because you've been going to church for 10 years doesn't mean you've grown. If you're still mean, sarcastic and rude and impatient. It doesn't matter how much Bible you know, we still know you're a baby. How do we know you're a baby? Because when you don't go your, go, when it doesn't go your way, you always throw a tantrum. Oh, it got quiet right there. Well, I know how to quote scripture. It don't matter how much scripture you could quote, it's how much scripture you're living. Is it affecting your emotions? Are you becoming more graceful? Are you becoming more sweet? Are you becoming more kind? When a person is mature, they grow in patience. They grow in happiness. They grow in peace. And they also grow in their relationships. I got one clap over there. Praise. Yeah, thank you. How many want to grow in and grace. It also means to grow in prosperity. I love that. But, uh, but the word, but it also says you'll grow in peace as well. Grace and peace. The word peace means peace and tranquility of mind. Tranquility of mind. The more you grow in the Lord, the more peaceful thoughts you have. You know, in the hood, 
I, because I'm from the hood. Well, how do you know you're from the hood? Well, I'll tell you how I know I'm from the hood. When I, when I, when I was, I mean, I was from the hood, I had a big boom box in my truck. It wasn't a boom box, it was a home speaker. And I remember putting that speaker, it was, I put in that speaker in back of my seat. And I would sit almost like, I, there was no room, but I had my, but I had my, Speakers booming with bass. I remember going to Stater Brothers because some of you guys don't remember this boom boxes. Remember boom boxes? I used to walk like this with my boom box, big one, blasting it at Stater Brothers. Waiting for anybody to say anything like, What? I am hood, I am gangster. But this is what I learned. We love loud music because we want to drown out our thoughts because our thoughts are so loud. How do you know that you're growing in the Lord? Your peace is growing. Your thoughts are more quiet. You could handle being in a room with no noise and feeling good. How many want to be there? Because until you have peace, it don't matter where we place you, there's going to be a war inside of you. You could be in a Caribbean beach, drinking a pina colada, virgin pina colada, of course. And you're sitting there at the beach, but if you don't have peace with the Lord, I don't care how great the scenery is, there's going to be a war in you, there's going to be a dissatisfaction. But I got good news for you. The more you get to know the Lord and His Word, the more tranquility you're going to have in your heart and your soul and in your mind. It also means an exemption from rage and anger and war, harmony and peaceful relationships prosperity, the state of a soul assured of salvation through faith in Christ, so fearing nothing from God. Would you like to grow in peace? I, I would, I've said this over and over, that the richest person in this room is not the person that has the most money. The richest person in this room is the person that has the most peace. You could, when, when you got peace, you could be opening a can of refried beans and you're smiling with just a little tor tortilla. But when you don't have peace, you could be eating a filet mignon with a lobster and be miserable. And that's why, that's why we see some of the people that have accomplished great wealth in their lives, but their marriages and their families are falling apart and they're still suicidal because this world cannot give you the peace that only God can give you. The search is over. You don't need more alcohol. You don't need more weed. You don't need another girl. You don't need another guy. What you need is greater knowledge of your relationship with Jesus Christ. And the better you get to know him, the more peace and grace and favor and blessing will be upon your life. Say it with me, more. Do you know what that means? That you should be happier next year than you are this year. The little anxiety thing you have now, by next year, it should be, it should get to the point that it barely exists. It just didn't exist because you resisted it. It exists because you've grown in your knowledge of who God is. Life doesn't cause fear anymore because you know this. There's a God that loves me and God's perfect love casts out all fear. And if that God that created the heavens and the earth is for me, then it doesn't matter what's coming against me. I used to be fearful because I didn't know who God was. So number two. How do we grow? By practicing what we've learned. We learn the word to practice, not just to know it. We will not grow maturity and skill and effectiveness and love to be more like Jesus if we don't immerse ourselves in practicing and applying his word. Say it with me. Immerse yourself in practicing and applying the word. In 1 Timothy 4.15, look what it says. Practice these things. 
immerse yourself in them so that others, so all may see your progress. When you're practicing, people are going to start seeing your, pra- your, your progress. How do we know you're making progress? We could see it in your lifestyle. We could see it in your conversation. We could see it in the way you're loving people. We could see it in your attitude. We could see it in your disposition. We could see it in your faith. We could see it in your results. We could see it in your career. We could see it in everywhere because you're growing and we see it. So real growth, not only you see it, but other, other people see it. Why well, this is important. When other people see your, gro- your growth, you know what it turns into? A testimony. They're going to say, how did you grow like that? And you're going to say, through knowing Jesus. And you could grow just like I did through knowing Jesus. You know how crazy I was. You know how angry I was. You know how addicted I was. You know I was a liar. You know I was a thief. You know I was a cheat. But something happened and I realized I didn't want to live that life anymore. And instead of pursuing things, I began to immerse myself in becoming more like Jesus Christ. I'm immersed in practicing. Someone say practice. There's a, there's a, one of my, my ushers in the back. He's real buff. But when he came to our church, he wasn't buff. He wasn't. He, he, was, he, wasn't, he wasn't much stronger than me, I don't think. I would have fought him in the back the way he was. No, I was kidding. But now I wouldn't. I wouldn't mess with him. I didn't know that as soon as he became a Christian, he stopped alcohol, he stopped drugs, and he started now exercising his spirit. And he started exercising his body. Well, a year into this, I didn't ask him, do you work out? I said, how often do you work out? Because I didn't have to ask him he worked out. I seen his muscle mass. I should have asked him, do you take steroids or not? I, was <laughs> I didn't ask him that. He's a brother. <laughs> but he's buff. So I just started working out myself. Last week is crazy. I went one time to the gym. But it's better than what I was doing before. I wasn't going at all. But the first time that I got there, I saw my buff brother. He's from the same exact gym. He came up to me right away. He was so happy to see me in the gym. And he wanted to work our partner. He goes, Pastor Marco, you want to work out with me? I go, no. I don't want to work out with you. I run my own pace. I'm not here to be tortured or die. Because for me to keep up with him and he's been working out would not work out. So uh, this is the idea. Not everybody here is at the same level of growth, but God is calling you to grow. And he wants you to start exercising and practicing what you learn. Because if you practice what you're learning, you're going to grow. You're going to grow. And when you grow, people are going to see your progress. And when they see your progress, it makes you effective at reaching them. People don't want to follow people that aren't progressing. Stop witnessing the people when you're not obeying the word. This is what I'm saying. You got to practice what you preach, homie. Don't just be a preacher. Be a preacher that lives it. Let them see you're not perfect, but you're practicing. You're not the same person you used to be. You're not quite where you want to be, but I know this. I am stronger than I used to be. I have more peace than I used to have. And what used to stumble me is not causing me to stumble anymore. I am growing. Now, we must... Practice. The word practice is repeated performance or exercise for the purpose of acquiring skill and proficiency. All this is saying is stop expecting to grow in an area that you're not practicing consistently. Now, I am so proud that you're coming to church. Make it consistent. Keep showing up to the gym. 
Keep showing up to the church. Keep showing up to the messages. Keep, sh- come on, show up to the Wednesday. Show up to the Thursday. Show up to the Friday. We're getting ready to have opportunities to hear the Word of God. And God's going to give us messages we've never heard. God's going to prepare us. Is there anybody here that's saying, I'm not sure hearing this Word. I'm going to practice this Word. I'm going to put effort in this. And I'm ready to get some results. Maybe you never heard this. We must train ourselves to live godly lives. Maybe you've never heard this. I, I think in church, I've never heard it. I, I always hear the Holy Spirit's going to do the work. The Holy Spirit gives you the muscle, the power, the faith. He gives you his spirit, but he doesn't do you for you. You're going to have to train yourself to be disciplined. You got to train yourself to be consistent. How do, you, how do you begin to grow? You start exercising what you need to do. And when you exercise what you need to do, you get stronger. Right now, I can't bench what but my brother back there can. But I guarantee, I'm not in competition with him. I'm in competition with me. But all I know this, I've been going like for a month. And I'm benching more than I was when I first started. Well, how much you're benching? That's not your business. This is my number. You get your own number. I wish I could just pray to grow in muscle. I wish I could just eat whatever I wanted to eat and still have a six pack. I don't have a six pack. I got one pack with another pack over it. One of these days, you're going to say, I see you working out. Right now, you don't see it, but I will be there. (laughs) How many want to grow? Come on, how many want to grow? We have to train ourselves. Train yourself to be godly. Physical training is good. But training for godliness, that means training your spirit, training your soul is much better. Promise and benefits in this life and the life to come. It's saying work out in the physical, but make sure you're working out in the spirit. Because the spiritual workout, the spiritual training, the spiritual growth will benefit you here and will benefit you in eternity. This is a better way to exercise than just physical. Amen? Train to be godly. That means devotion to God, holiness, respect, and reverence to God. See, unless we grow through training, we cannot train or teach others to grow. So I have to train myself, I have to take responsibility, I need to show up to the classes, I need to show up to impartation, I mean, anniversary services, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and this is what I did. Do your best, do all you can do, we'll talk about that in a minute, and then you're going to see the growth. But don't expect to see growth in an area you're not practicing. Unless we grow through training, we cannot train and teach others to grow. In Hebrews 5.12, it says, you have been believers so long now that you ought to be teaching others. Check that out. You've been in church long enough, some of you. Been serving God long enough. He goes, by now, you should be teaching people. We shouldn't be going over the basics with you still. What it's saying is you should have grown by now to the point that you could take someone underneath your wing and let me show you what I've learned. Look what it says. You ought to be teaching us. Instead, you need someone to teach you again the basics about God's word. It's possible to be behind schedule. It's possible to not be where you're supposed to be. And you're not where you're supposed to be and the reason is You did not train yourself to be disciplined, to study, to be consistent, to do and practice, to hear and do what you've learned. Verse 13, for someone who lives on milk is still an infant and doesn't know how to do what is right. Solid food are for those who are mature, who through training have the skill to recognize the difference between Right and wrong. 
How do you know you're maturing? You know you're maturing when you're able to make a distinction between right and wrong and have a conviction about it. That means you're maturing when you're watching Netflix and four F words come up, F this, F that, F bomb, four of that. And you don't even notice. When you begin to grow, you start noticing, wait a second, this is not something I be, should be consuming. And you start getting a conviction about it. If you, have a convi if you don't have a conviction that sleeping with a girl that's not your wife is wrong and it's sin, you're immature. We still got to teach you that stuff. You should be past that already. Do you know there's people in churches and pastors that are still babies? Just because they're preaching doesn't mean they're mature. Because if you got a pastor that's up here and he's sleeping with, with somebody that's not his wife, I don't care how much Bible he teaches, we know this, he's a baby. How do we know he's a baby? He don't know right from wrong and he has no conviction. As you grow, I'm not expecting to have the conviction I got because I've been growing in the Lord, but your conviction about right and wrong and understanding what's right and wrong should grow. You should not be able to continue living a lifestyle of immorality and be okay with it. There should be something within you that says this is wrong. I know what's right. I know what's wrong. I repent of it. Lord, take this desire away from me. Set me free. I want to be just like you. If you're still justifying your sin, all it means is you're immature. You still need a little milk. Let's get you a, a baba. Are you okay? If you're super emotional, you're getting your feelings hurt all the time, here's your papa. Well, you don't know. I got, a, I got a degree in theology. I don't care what degree you got in theology. You're still an infant. You're still a baby because your emotions haven't grown up. You're still falling for the same old things. I'm not saying you need to be perfect, but there should be some progress in your life that what you used to struggle with. There, come on, there's some progress in that area. I'm not falling the way I used to fall. I am growing and I'm getting conviction. You guys are clapping. That's awesome. How do we grow through training? Some of us, how we grow through what? Some of us, for the first time we're here, this, well, I got to train? I got to grow? I thought I was just going to naturally grow. You're not going to naturally grow. You're going to have to put effort in this. You're going to have to activate your faith. You're going to have to start doing what you don't want to do because it's the right thing to do, and I just do what I need to do even when I don't want to do it. That's called discipline. Are you going to church? I don't feel like it, baby. Bad, baby. Ah. <laughs> what happened? I don't feel like it. When, see, when you get mature, you don't live by your feelings. You live by your convictions. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand. Come on, we could grow in this stuff. We could grow. Now, I want you to understand. Don't pressure people to be at your level of conviction. All you do is teach them. Let the Holy Spirit convict them. Number three, how do we grow? Take advantage of every opportunity to grow. In Proverbs 10, 5, it says, He who gathers during the summer and takes advantage of his opportunities is a son who acts wisely. It's describing two sons, and one of them acts wisely. This is how he acts wisely. He takes advantage of the learning opportunity. He takes advantage of the opportunity that's presented to himself. We have an opportunity in these next three or four days on, on, on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, night sessions and day sessions on Thursday and Friday. There's a great opportunity that's going to present itself for us to learn and be exposed to greater truth than we've ever been exposed to. This is a time of growth. This is the question. Will you take advantage of the opportunity that's presented itself? Or will you talk yourself out of opportunity? If you talk yourself out of opportunity, 
this will happen, you will not act wisely, and you probably will develop a habit of talking yourself out of what you should be doing. There's people that as soon as they hear an opportunity, because they're wise, they act on it immediately. And the reason they act on it immediately, because they see this opportunity to grow. And I'm not going to let this opportunity pass me by, because where I'm going and where I'm headed, I want to be prepared for whatever life gives me. And I want to be prepared for the opportunities. I want to be prepared to be able to be a mission, a witness. I want to be able to share my faith. I want to be able to be promoted. I want to be ready. So they take advantage of the opportunities. Who takes, they act, those that take advantage of the opportunities act wisely. This is what it means. They, they wisely means one who has comprehension and success and prosperity to be a teacher. One who gives wisdom and insight and expertise. This is what he's saying. It's one that acts wisely, the one that gets comprehension and begins to act on it. Now, wisely has, is tied to the word prosperity and success. Because you cannot act wisely without being successful at the same time. Wise decisions and wise people have successful lives and everything they touch succeeds. God doesn't just want one area of your life to succeed. He wants every area of your life to succeed. This, but we need some wisdom. What's the wisdom? I'm hearing and I'm comprehending and I'm, I'm applying and I'm succeeding. There, there are some people that would say, I tried church, it didn't work. And I would say, liar, liar, pants on fire. No, you tried going to church like you tried signing up for the gym and you never showed up. The other day I went to the gym. Let's talk about that because I had to go. I went one time last week. And this would happen. I spent like five minutes working out. And an hour witnessing. I was exercising my spirit. That's what it was. After I was done an hour witnessing, I went home. But this is the reality. I got some spiritual advancement, of course. I'm leading people to the Lord. There's like four gang members that I'm leading to the Lord. They're, 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 they're just getting ready for a rumble. And they're buffing themselves up. But they already told me. I'm coming to church, and I know they're coming to church. I follow up on every time I say, hey, what's up, what's up, what's up, what's up, what's up? And last time they said, thank you for talking to us, man. We were just still talking about what you told us. He goes, we're coming to church. I go, I know you are, because I'm not going to give up on you. But th this is what I'm saying. I showed up to the gym, and I didn't work out really. All I'm saying is, I'm not going to get any muscle. I don't care about that. I care about the souls. Come on. But, but this, this is what we're talking about with you. Make sure that when you show up to the house of God, you come to work out. You come to get, get this word and exercise it so you can start getting some success, start acting wisely. But look what it says. But, but he who sleeps or the son who sleeps during harvest, during the opportunity and ignores the moment of opportunity, ignores the opportunity, the moment of opportunity is a son who acts shamelessly. There's an opportunity. I'm just going to ignore it. I'm going to talk myself out of it. It really doesn't matter. If I show up, I don't show up. Your next level of growth, and, and this, is, this is truth. There's some of you that are fighting the battles of your life. Your kids are hurting. They're broken. Satan has an assignment to kill, steal, and destroy. You are in major warfare, and you got to be careful that you don't have a lackadaisical attitude about the warfare you're in. That means if you're going to start winning this fight, you're going to have to fight. You're going to have to fight against your thoughts. You're going to have to fight against your complacency. You're going to have to fight against your schedule. And, and for some of us, Sunday church has been a great discipline you've developed. But God is saying, I'm ready to take you to another level. You're going to have to now go to the next level. You're going to have to show up Wednesday or Thursday or Friday. God is saying, I need to develop you to the next level because the warfare that you're in is going to take more than the effort you're giving me. Is that right? So talking ourselves, the opportunity is a son who acts shamelessly. And that word shamelessly in the, in the Hebrew 
it's pronounced boosh. Don't be bushy or bougie. Don't be a boosh. Right? It means to be disappointed or delayed. That's crazy. He's saying those that talk themselves out of opportunity, this is what their future will be, full of disappointment. And this is why I'll be full of disappointment, because your expectations and your hopes will not come true. And not only will you be disappointed, the people that are dependent on you will be disappointed. But the scripture is also saying there will be a delay on your life. The things that God wants to do in your life are going to be put off and put off and put off and put off. Understand what you don't learn today, you're still going to have to learn to grow. Stop delaying your breakthrough. Stop delaying your ministry. Stop delaying your prosperity. Stop delaying your next level. God is saying, don't talk yourself out of this moment of opportunity. There's a great door of opportunity that's opening up right now. And God is saying, I'm preparing you for a future that's greater than you could ever imagine. But this is preparation time. And only those that are prepared are going to be able to partake in the harvest that's coming. When Jesus went to his hometown, people missed an opportunity of a lifetime. Just think about this. Imagine Jesus coming to your town. Like, what would you do? Would you change your schedule to be there? Or would you be at Walmart instead of being where Jesus is at? Do you know that every time we open this door, there's an opportunity to grow? I've heard people say this, Pastor, I'm there in spirit. I go, you're lying, man. You're not here in spirit. Your spirit's at Walmart. Wherever your body is, your spirit is there. You're not, the, you're not God that your spirit's everywhere. You can't be here in spirit. <laughs> what are you, a ghost? Right? We need to get in it with everything we got. And look what the scripture says in Matthew 6, 4. We'll end it with the scripture. Then Jesus told them, a prophet is, not, is honored everywhere except in his own hometown and among his relatives and his own family. And because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. This scripture is saying, Jesus saying, I wanted to heal all of them, but I only could heal some of them. And the reason I couldn't heal all of them because they didn't appreciate the opportunity that was before them and they didn't believe in me. And this is what we're going to do, some three practical things that we're going to do to prepare to receive and grow to the max. Number one, we're going to do this together. Say we're going to do it together. We're going to fast for three days, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. The reason we need to fast is we need to get unified. Also, we need to clean our minds and our lifestyle right now and get ready to receive because we don't want to be like these people in Jesus' hometown that he showed up and they weren't ready for miracles. So they stayed sick, they stayed lost, they stayed broken, they were now restored, not because the restorer wasn't there, not because the healer wasn't there, not because the savior wasn't there. They were talking themselves out of the opportunity. Their faith wasn't there. Their expectation wasn't there. We need to show up Wednesday night ready to receive an encounter with Jesus Christ. There's people traveling from all over the world, even from Poland. They're coming ready to receive from God. Let's make sure we show up together fasting. We want to hear from God. We want to receive from God. And we're going to do all we can to prepare. Number two, we're going to fast. Well, how do you fast? Three ways you can fast. Three times to fast. One is you could do a liquid fast for three days. You won't die. That means you could drink juices and... Uh, you could drink water for three days. You could, for three days, that's, you could do that. Number two, you could fast by just eating, doing a, a Daniel fast, and that's more vegetables, uh, uh, nuts, and stuff like that. Now, if you're a vegetarian, you can't do that one because that's you. You can do another one, right? The other fast is a, is, is a fast until like 6 o'clock in the afternoon, and then you eat a light meal for three days. Not a full, like, you're not going to Lucille's and, or, or famous days and feast, feast. You're not doing that. OK? 
okay? You, you, you'll eat a light meal, maybe a salad or whatever, and then you go into the next day. We got to do this because there's going to be some victories that we're going to get, that we're only going to get through fasting and prayer as we get serious with God. That's called exercise. If someone said, fasting is an exercise. We need to start sitting, look, teaching our body to do what we tell it to do instead of our body telling us what to do. We got to get our body in check. Amen. Three, what we're going to do is bring a special offering to the, to the house of God. Stop expecting to grow in areas you have no seed planted in. One of the greatest things that we could do as, as people, as we have finances and God blesses us, that we use it to establish churches. We use it to save more souls. We use it to open more homes. We have, we have homes. We want to open more homes. We're helping people get off the streets. We're helping single moms with their babies that are living in cars to get off the streets. And we have a men's home, I mean a women's home that takes care of them and registers these kids back in school and helps these mamas to become mamas again and restore their relationship with their kids. That's awesome. We're helping people that are coming out of prison. They don't have to go back into the streets. They could come into our homes and let them know we're going to train you. You're no longer going to be the man you used to be. You're not going back to prison. We're setting you free through training. We could, we could build more orphanages that we're doing in Kenya. We could, we could build a church. We, right now, we need a church in, for our L.A. campus. We want to build churches in, 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 in Moreno Valley and, and Victorville and, and other states. We want to expand what God is doing. And the greatest thing that we could do to glorify God is to build his church. So we're going to get an opportunity to do that. And we're going to give. We're going to show up. And then we're going to fast. But I tell you this, do everything you can. If you could, I would say this, do your best, whatever your best is. If you could show up to all services and even the morning sessions, sign up for all of it. The only people that should not be here on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and morning sessions are the ones that can't. Don't have a day off and spend it driving around your car and shopping. Use that day off to be in the house of God because the opportunity of a lifetime is going to be here. God is preparing our church to bring in the biggest harvest we've ever seen. And God is preparing you to do more than you could ever imagine. And this is your time. This is summertime. This is a great opportunity to prepare for every other season of your life. How many are ready to become stronger, more peaceful, make some progress? Come on, grow in knowledge. Let's give the Lord a hand. Christian, can you close this out, please? Let's give the Lord a hand if you receive something from come God on, today. Come on, let's give God some praise if you receive that word today. How many are ready to grow in this place? You're saying, I'm ready to grow. Well, before anyone leaves, just a few minutes, just stay seated right at your seat. We want to give you an opportunity to take action here and make the best decision you could make after hearing this word. The greatest decision that anybody can make in their lifetime is giving their life to Jesus Christ. Why is that so important? Now I want everyone to hear this. We all know that this is true. I don't need to know you personally, and you don't need to know me personally to know that we've all sinned. <clears throat> we've all made mistakes. The Bible says that all have fallen short <coughs> excuse me, of the glory of God. We've all made mistakes. We've all fallen short. We've all done wrong. How many know that's true? Just nod your head if you know that's true. Put your hand up if it's double true. Put both hands up if you really sin. Hallelujah. He stood up. Come on. He came to the altar already. Feet in the air. Come on. We've all made mistakes. We've all sinned. We've all done wrong. We've broken the law. You know, the Bible actually says there's a price for that. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Meaning when I sin, I now owe a high price. It's hanging on my head. It's a debt that I cannot pay by being a good person. I can't pay it by coming to church every week and I can't pay it by memorizing the Bible. I cannot pay this off. No amount of good I can do can pay this debt. The wage, the price is death. So we start experiencing death in this life, in our families, our relationships, and our health. And then after we die on this earth, we are eternally separated from God forever in a place called hell because we've sinned. I know this sounds crazy. You may be thinking, I haven't sinned that much to deserve hell. Well, here's the reality. Even one sin can separate us from God. So that's bad news. But there is good news. This is the good news. 
God so loved the world, he so loved you, he so loved the person that was deep in his sin, he so loved the drug addict, he so loved the adulterer, he so loved the person that was, uh, that was bound and broken and lost and hurting others and, 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 and bound in their sin, he so loved you and me that he gave his one and only son to die on a cross, a death he did not deserve, so that whoever believes in him will not perish, will not die, will not experience death, but will have everlasting life. This is the good news. So Jesus willingly gave up his life for you and me. Jesus willingly went to the cross for you and me. Jesus didn't deserve it, but he gave up his own life to pay your price, to pay my price. Aren't we thankful, aren't we grateful that we serve a God that would come down to this earth, live in a body like ours, die a horrible death on a cross, but resurrect from the dead so that we can be saved. This is the gospel, that's the good news. So now is where we take action. Now is where we respond. The Bible says whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ today, if you surrender your life to him right now in this moment, you can be saved, forgiven, and set free and have everlasting life. Maybe thinking, well, what if I just do more good? What if I try to get better and come back? That's not how this works. That's not even how hospitals work. Hospitals don't say, go heal your sickness and then come back and I'll see you. No, and God doesn't work that way either. God says, look, come to me just the way you are, with your brokenness, with your sin, with your pain, with your hurt, and the lowest point you've been, come to me in that way and I'll give you my grace. I'll give you my joy. I'll give you my peace. I'll give you my blessing. Come on, how many want, how many know that's a great exchange? God wants you to have that today. So here's what I'm gonna do. I will count to three, and after I count to three, anybody in this room that's res that wants to accept Jesus and is ready to respond and say, that's me, then I want you to just raise your hand up after I count to three. Are you ready? Here we go. One, two, Three, raise your hand. You're saying, I want to receive Jesus. I want to be forgiven. I see all those hands. I see all these hands to my right. I see your hand here. I'm proud of you, sir. I see your hands in the back. Anybody else to my left? I see you over here. I see you guys over here. I see all you guys over here. I'm proud of you guys. Anybody else? You're saying that's me. I'm proud of you. I see you in the back there. Can we do me one more favor? Before we leave, can we stand to our feet? And everybody that raised your hand, everyone that raised your hand, can you do me one more favor? Could you make your way out of your seat, up to the aisle, and come to the front here? And we have a team that wants to pray for you and congratulate you. And church, as they're coming up, let's clap for them right now. Let's get excited. This is a big moment in their life. They'll never be the same again. Come on, church, let's clap for every soul that's coming forward right now. still coming. They're still coming, church. We clap for every soul that comes to know Jesus. This is a big moment. Amen. Proud of you guys. Proud of you. Awesome. Awesome. Everyone that came forward, just look at me for a second. We want to help you in your walk. So what we're going to do, we have a class that's called Starting at the Way. And in this class, it's going to teach you what baptism is. And we're actually going to help you get baptized. So that's your next step. Take this class and get baptized. And we, also, we also have a devotional book to help you every day. Spend a little bit of time with God. Like Pastor Marco said, how do we grow? We grow by, by understanding His Word, by knowing God more. So we're going to show you how to do that. So the person in front of you, they're going to pray for you. And then they're going to sign you up for your next step. Okay, and we're going to get you registered for that class. And we're going to get you registered to get baptized. Come on, this is exciting, isn't it? Uh, we need a few more gentlemen up here. If we got some men out here that can pray. Men DG leaders. Got some men up here at the altar. This is awesome. All right, let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. And I want you to go ahead and repeat this prayer after me. Say this with me. Say, God, thank you for giving your son Jesus to die on the cross and raise from the dead so that I can be saved. 
I admit that I've sinned against you. I've turned my face from you. But right now, I turn to you. I repent. I turn away from my sin. And I turn to you. I believe in you, Jesus. My faith is in you. Be my Lord and Savior. Fill me with your spirit and make me a new creation. From this moment forward, I'll never be the same again. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Come on, church. One more shout of praise to all that God has done. This is awesome. We love you so much.